Hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Rebecca, and today we are tier ranking every hockey romance I have ever read on Kindle Unlimited. I counted, and there are 55 total. That is including a few novellas, um, some continuations of full length novels, some standalones. But for the most part, these are full length novels that are still available on Kindle Unlimited. Some of them have been picked up by traditional publishers and aren't available anymore. Some of them have been picked up by traditional publishers and are still available. So let's dive on in. I chose five categories. I have I love him and I will hear no criticism. I need him in a way that's concerning to feminism. I need him biblically. I need him in a way that is concerning to feminism. Lots of question marks. I'll insert the memes that go along with some of these so you'll understand what I mean. Sorry to this man. Sorry to this man. Going full Kiki Palmer, usually that means that either the book did not leave a lasting impression or it just it wasn't worth the higher categories. And then last but not least is I Don't Know Her. This is a book that I probably should have DNF'd. I really did not enjoy my time with it, and I likely won't try the author again. So let's dive on in. First up, we have Broody Devil by Melissa Ivers. This one I'm going to put in the question mark section because I don't remember a single thing about this book. Other than the male main character was meant to be a difficult guy. I don't know. I think it was like a Vegas marriage situation. I remember having a good time with it. And when I looked up on Goodreads, I had rated it highly. But I couldn't tell you a single solitary detail about that book. Okay, next we have Stand and Defend by Sloan St. James. I am putting that and I love him and I will hear no criticism. That was the first Sloan St. James book I ever read. I don't know how I went so long without reading her, but I am going to be reading her back catalog because that book was perfect to me. It was the perfect blend of spice and relationship building and each character kind of dealing with their own shit. The female main character in this book is about to get married to this really sleazy dude who's also abusive and she gets out of that situation and is trying to like reclaim her life and figure out what's next for herself. And the male main character helps her along with that. He watched his mom essentially do the same thing when she left his dad and is very aware of what it looks like when someone is leaving a terrible situation. And he was just perfect. He was great. Ooh, next we have Jasper by Lulu Moore. I loved this book. I'm going to put this in. I need him in a way that's concerning in feminism because Jasper was great. I had a hard time with the first book in that series, and in fact, it's right here, so I'm going to go ahead and put that in the question mark section, because, oh wait, I'm sorry, I need to do this in reverse. Jasper is the first one, and I had a hard time with that one. Cooper, I loved. Jasper I had a hard time with because there were just some writing errors in it that were, like, aggressive, <laughs> and at least when it comes to, like, your reading experience, and I say that because... Jasper plays for a New York hockey team that's supposed to be in the NHL, and he's American. The woman he chases down and then eventually starts dating is British. At random times throughout the book, Jasper suddenly starts talking in British slang that she has never said to him before. And it's stuff that I don't think he would just regularly pick up unless he was just like really into British pop culture, and it just didn't make any sense. Same thing happened with um, his mom later in the book. It was just very random, and it would just kind of take you out of it. I also just didn't love the way that they initially got together. It was kind of creepy to me. But Cooper was perfect. Cooper is set actually in England. They are over there for Jasper's wedding, and Cooper is falling for the maid of honor, who happens to be the sister of the female character from the first book. And he... I don't know how to even describe why I loved him so much. I just did. I just did. Okay, next, I'm going to do these three together because, number one, they're sitting next to each other, but they all go together, and it's Consider Me, Play With Me, and Unravel Me by Becca Mack. This is a series that got me into hockey romances. I discovered Consider Me. I read it in literally one sitting. I started it at 10 a.m. I finished it at, like, 7 p.m., and I didn't realize that it was that late until my dog was crying to go outside and I had like this burning need to pee because I had been sitting in the same position on the couch for a literal nine hours reading that book. I was enthralled. It was so good. It was exactly what I needed at that time. I think it's one of those books that people have very polarizing views on. People are either obsessed with Carter and his gang of hockey boys or they can't stand them. 
And I kind of understand, but I think because of where I was mentally at that time, it was just one of those books that was in the right place, the right time for me. And then Play With Me came out a few months after that, and I gobbled that up. Absolutely gobbled that up. I love Garrett and Jenny. And then Unravel Me came out this last year and was so good. It was so, so good. Can't wait for Jackson's book that comes out in July. I will hear no criticisms about this series. Absolutely none. Next, we have the pucking wrong number. And this is going to go into sorry to this man. Um, I just remember thinking, oh, I feel like I've read too many hockey romances. I should read something else. And I do enjoy a dark romance, love a mafia romance. And someone recommended this to me. No, just no. Then we have Famous Last Words by C.W. Farnsworth. I'm going to put this in the middle with the question marks because I don't, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. I don't know. Actually, let's pop that and sorry to this man. I know I had a good time. Goodread says I had a good time. Couldn't tell you a single solitary thing about this book. Ooh, Unsteady. I'm going to put that in. I need him in a way that's concerning the feminism. And it's not as aggressive <laughs> as my feelings for some of these other books. But I loved Reese Kotesky. I love his whole family and the way they showed up for Sadie and her whole family. And that book was so fucking wholesome and I can't wait for the next one. Um, Peyton Curran got picked up by a traditional publisher uh, earlier, or I guess later in 2023. So this book is actually being re-released now. I don't know when the sequel comes, but it's soon. Same thing for Breakaway, Grace Riley. That goes up there too. Cooper was just a very hot and commanding male main character, which is not something you often say about a um, male main character for a college hockey romance, but that boy knew what he was doing. And he goes up there. I feel like I should do these together. I only see two, so I've thoroughly pucked. I'm gonna put this in the middle here along with double pucked and puck, yeah, should be in here. There it is. I'm putting these here just because they just don't reach the top two tiers for me. They were such a good time. I will read the fourth book when it comes out. I absolutely love it. Each book follows, actually all three of these women are friends now that I think about it, um, follows one of the heroines going through something, whether that's losing the place that they live or your ex breaks up with you because you find out he's fucking your boss and now they want you to photograph their wedding. Crazy, right? Yeah, each of these books kind of had some far-fetched moments in them. And then two hockey players come to the rescue of the woman, sometimes individually, and then they end up as a thruple. And sometimes those two come together and then they end up as a thruple. And it's a good time. It's a good time. It just wasn't top two tier good time. However, Shut Out by Avery Keelan. Yeah, I need him in a way that's bad for feminism. Tyler, another college boy that just knew what he was doing. Mm. 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 Most important line of that uh, book for me, wear whatever you want, Tink. I can fight. Say no more. Puck Shy by Kayla Gross. Mm, I'm going to put this up here. I need him in a way that's concerned with feminism because I forget the guy's name. Maybe it was Luke. In the first novella, his twin pretends to be him and it creates this big miscommunication moment with the female main character of that book who is the sister of um, the girl in this book. And it was just, it was a big thing and it blew up and it just didn't need to be. It just didn't need to be that way. This one was hot out of the gate. There was honesty out of the gate for the most part. And there was like a tiny possibility for the same miscommunication thing to happen, but she nipped it in the bud like three chapters in. I, it was so good. It was so good. Ooh, Sunny Disposition. I'm so sorry to this book. I am going to put it in, I don't know her. I wished I liked that book. I wanted to like it so very bad. I just, I didn't, I didn't like it. I, it wasn't written well for me. I really struggled with it. It started to feel really repetitive. And yet, in this moment, I can't tell you why. Can't tell you a single detail. I just know I gave that book like one and a half or two stars. Okay, Offside by Avery Keelan is going to go in this section because it's just not as good as Shut Out. It's just not. It was the first book in the series. It did what it needed to do, but it just wasn't as good. This one's the puck drop. I don't know. 
Hmm. Some of these covers are different than when I read them. And so now I'm looking at it and I'm like, I almost don't recognize this. Let's go to my handy dandy phone and see if I can find details. The puck drop. Okay, yeah, Jacqueline Snow, I gave this one three stars. I don't know. I don't know. I think this one was, oh, you know what? I do remember this one. This one was about a, was he a player? I don't know if he even was technically a player. I feel like he was an assistant coach and he starts dating the coach's daughter. I don't think he realizes it was the daughter at first and then it becomes a thing. And she's working with the team for a school project with statistics and things. I don't know. I remember having a good time with it, but I don't remember a ton of details. So that one's going to go in this middle row. Collide by Ball Cabra. That one's going to go in I Need Him in a Way That's Concerning Feminism because that man stood up to her NHL legend of a father knowing damn well he was going to be entering the draft within like, I don't know, a few months. And he didn't care. He didn't care. He stood up for his woman. He didn't care. Ooh, okay. This one, I can't remember the title because it's like cut off. It's a Celeste Breyer's book. And it's going in that bottom section because I didn't have a good time. I rated that one star on Goodreads. That might be the only one star review I've ever given. I, it was just, it was just bad. It was just bad. I'm so sorry. The best kind of forever. That's what that was called. I didn't like it. Um, Pucked by Helena Hunting is also going in there. That book came out in 2015 and I give it some 2015 grace. You, When you read it, you can tell it came out in 2015. It's, it's a no for me. It's a no for me. The Keeper by Bella Matthews. I'm going to put in sorry to this man. Not because I don't recognize him, but because I just don't want to. I don't want to recognize him. The book itself was not bad. It just felt like it didn't know what it wanted to do. And sometimes that's worse. There was a lot happening. There was at one point some like suspense. And I'm like, I didn't ask for this. Why is this happening? Ooh, Perfect Boy this is going to go and I don't know her. This book, the writing was a little, it was fine, but it wasn't great. But for being the sixth book in the series, you would think that the writing would be ironed out at that point. And it just didn't feel that way. I also really did not like, well, a number of things. Towards the end of the book, this the one of their friends goes into the hospital for an asthma attack and goes into a coma. Yeah, you heard me right. She goes into a coma. Now, when I made commentary about this on my Goodreads review... Someone said, well, we learned about that girl's illness in an earlier book. And if you'd read it, then maybe you would know that. Okay, fine. I'll give you that because I did just dive right into this. An Instagram reel got me and I was like, oh, it's an interconnected standalone. It's fine. I can just pick it up right here. I don't know what story you could have told me however many books back that we get that girl's backstory that still would have made me believe that she went into a coma on the back of an asthma attack. Unless you told me she had like cystic fibrosis or something similar to that. And even then, I, I'm i not saying that that couldn't happen. I'm just saying that if you have chronic illnesses, I feel like a lot of the time you know what to do before it gets that bad. I'm not saying you it's, it's perfect. I'm not saying it happens all the time. Because there are plenty of times where people end up in situations they never thought they'd see themselves in. I'm just saying... If we're going to go based off of something semi-realistic in a book, a coma off the back of an asthma attack is just not, it's not it. It's not it. Powerless by Miss Elfsley Silver goes into, I love him and I will hear no criticism. This is often, well, at least before Hopeless came out, was often listed as people's least favorite in the Chestnut Spring series. And I don't understand. I don't. I don't, but I'm also a hockey girly, and I know that a lot of the people who were saying that I, when they were reading the series were yeehaw girlies. They're yeehaw girlies through and through, so I can understand why, and also because the girl in the main story is a cousin, and she's not a part of, like, the nuclear family at Chestnut Springs, although, like, let's be real, everyone's a part of the nuclear family in there, because once you meet that family, they bring you in, and it's a found family situation. 
I loved that book. It was phenomenal. I'm not ready to rant yet, so we're going to skip the score and go on to Icebound by Meredith Trapp. I'm going to put this in. I need him in a way that's concerning to feminism because I love a re- age gap romance that does not feel icky. And this one did not feel icky at all. I really, really liked how much Road Road would self-correct. Nina would make some comment to him because he would be like, oh, you're too young or this is, or that or this or that. And she would make a comment that would just be just factually correct. And instead of like doubling down and just being a dick about it, he would be like, huh, yeah, I could do that. Or I could change the way I think about that or whatever. And I just, I love him. He's a panty dropper. All right, Watch Your Mouth by Candy Signer also goes up here. Because Jackson? He's perfect. I love him. I don't know what it is with that woman and second book in her series, but they're, they always hit the hardest and they're always the best. And that one, that one was the best. That was so good. I'm, am excited for the third book. We're getting, um, daddy P's book. That's what she affectionately calls him. His name's Will something. That one's going to be like a single dad nanny situation. Um, and that comes out in April. I can't wait. The series is so fun. So, so fun. The fake out by Stephanie Archer. I uh, also need him in a way that's concerning for feminism. I, is his name Rory or is her name Rory? I'm mixing it up because I read The Fake Out and Face Off back to back. The Fake Out by Stephanie Archer and then Face Off by Tegan Hunter. And that really threw me. Rory Miller, that's his name. He's great. It was like a fake dating situation because her ex ends up on the getting traded to the hockey team. They broke up and she swore off dating hockey players ever again. And Rory has been hitting on her basically since she joined the team as um, a trainer. They went to high school together. So they've known each other for a long time and he's always had a thing for her. Her ex shows up. He's being a dick. Thinks she gets assigned to him as her, his trainer on purpose. She did not want that. And she's like, no, why would I want that? I'm dating Rory. And Rory's like, we're what? Yep, yep, yep. We're dating. Absolutely. We're dating. And then proceeds to just show up for her so well, even when she doesn't ask for it, even when she needs it most but won't ask for help. It was great. I also love that he nicknamed her his little fire-breathing dragon and then found her this little, like, I say little, it was a very expensive little tchotchke of a fire-breathing dragon, and it was very cute. 10 out of 10 recommend. The forward line is going to go into Sorry for This Man, not because it was bad, but because I can't remember a single goddamn thing about that book. I know it's why I choose. I know they're all hockey players. Couldn't tell you anything past that. Sorry. Okay, well, now that these three are together, I think it's time to rant. So we're going to put, I'm you're, y'all are going to scream. And I just, I need you to take a deep breath real quick and hear me out. The deal, the mistake, and the score, I'll go and I don't know her because I don't want to know her. I want to erase that experience from my brain. I do. The deal wasn't terrible. It was not the worst offender of these three books. We all know the mistake is the worst offender of these three books. And I understand that these were written from like 2015 to 2017. I I get it. I get it. The way y'all go up for these books, like they're groundbreaking to this day. Are y'all okay? What is wrong with you? No caveat, nothing. Acting like the sun shines out of that woman's ass. Please, please. Again, the first book was fine, but it wasn't great, and it got really repetitive. The second book, egregious. The third book, also not that good. I think the only reason you guys go up so hard for Dean De Laurentiis is because John was god-awful, I and he was your prize for surviving. That, ugh, not good. Behind the Net by Stephanie Archer. I didn't like this one nearly as much as The Fake Out, so it's going to go in that middle section, but that one was fine. I feel like Jamie's grumpy stick went on for stick went on for too long. But other than that, it was a good time. Blissful Hook. Sorry to this man. I don't remember anything about this. I remember having a good time. And it's Hannah Cohen, so like the writing was easy to get along with. But I don't remember. And you know what? Lucky Hit can go there too. Same series. Actually, Lucky Hit comes first, I think. And I think Blissful Hook is after. And then there's another one, if I can find it here, that's going to go there as well. 
between two periods. That was like a novella that you had to read in between the two of them. I don't know. It was fine. And you know what? Since we're on Hannah Cowan, let's put her greatest mistake. That one I will put a tear up. Because I remember having a good time with it, but I don't really remember any of the details. But I do remember thinking... Like, it was cool to see the son of the couple from Lucky Hit in there, and that was kind of a cool experience. The book after this actually was my favorite, but it's technically not hockey, so it didn't go into this list. But Her Grace Adventure, that's where shit pops off. Good time. Ooh, Mile High by Liz Tomford. I'm putting this in I Don't Know Her. Not because the book itself was, like, bad. The writing was great. It was very easy reading. And when I initially rated it, I rated it really high on Goodreads. Because I had a good time reading it. But there was just something, you know, niggling in the back of my head that was like, hey girl, pay close attention to this. Something feels off. Something feels off. You know when you go to sniff the milk and it doesn't immediately smell bad, but you're like, we're close to needing to to pour this out, but maybe I can get one more bowl of cereal out of it. I had that vibe from this book. And what I realized later is... Stevie is the female main character in that book, and Stevie felt like she was written by a white woman. Stevie has a black dad and a white mom, and physically, well, she's described in ways that you go, oh, she's mixed. There are certain descriptions of her where I was like, oh, that's a black girl through and through. And her dad is present in her life and is very, um, I don't know, vocal may be the wrong word, but just like supportive of her. And I just feel like she would have grown up as like a strong black girl. You know, having a a very present girl dad like that just would have would have brought that out. I her mom gave me the ick and was kind of corrected, but kind of not. And it just felt very much like a white woman wrote this. And so then I look up Liz Tomford and I see her cute little author photo. And I was like, oh, a white woman did write this. And not only is Stevie half black, but so is Xander's. Xander's is black. And the way he reacted to some of the things happening to Stevie just felt, I just it felt like a white woman wrote it. I don't know how else to describe it to you because it just, you could just tell. I am not of the mind that just because the characters in your book are not of your same race, you shouldn't write them. But I tend to lean towards, I wish you would just do secondary characters instead of your main characters. Because there is no point in making a character black if all they're going to be black and is their description. Or if you're going to create conflict moments like you did in Mile High with her mom and it just feels kind of gross. It wasn't, um, I wouldn't even say it's offensive because it, it really wasn't offensive writing or anything like that. I just felt icky afterwards. And I wouldn't recommend it. I just wouldn't. Okay, Right Man, Right Time by Megan Quinn is going to go in the questions because this book should have had the makings of me having a very good time with it. And I will say, like, generally speaking, I think I rated it a four on Goodreads because it was like one of those where it was like, this is a three and a half, but it's a positive three and a half. So you you round up since they don't do half stars. But it just felt like it kept getting almost to the execution, but just wasn't really busting through that finish line tape for me. So I'm going to put it there in the middle. Pucking all the way is going to sorry to this man. I actually, no, we're going to put in, I don't know her. This novella had the chance to be just super fun and steamy and a good time. And it was once you got past the fact that the male main character was an asshole for far too long for a novella. It was marketed as grumpy sunshine. And I feel like that's a little disingenuous. And he was just a jerk for no good reason. And it just is gross to me. Face off. I love him and I won't hear no criticism. Partly because that man is very Carter coded. I loved Lossie. He was great. Uh, Rory, the female character in this book, is a veterinarian who owns her own clinic. Actually, I think she has two at that point. And Lossie on Christmas Eve finds this puppy in an alleyway and then just on Google's like nearest vet clinic that's still open, finds it, goes over there, sees her. She can't stand him. He's the t- old teammate of her sister's boyfriend who has just recently retired from hockey. And Lossie has always thought she was hot, has always wanted to get with her. And she's like, no, you're a playboy. I have things to do. I don't want anything to do with you. He somehow ropes her into being this dog's mom with him, kind of. And what it is is that he finds her 
And at, that night after they, they figure out, like, okay, she's okay. Like, no major injuries or anything. She just needs to be fed. Given a warm place to sleep. He's like, okay, great. Like, see you later. And she's like, no, no, no. You're taking this dog with you. Like, you can't leave this dog here. This isn't a shelter. And he's like, okay, but how am I going to have a puppy while I'm in the middle of an NHL season? Like, I'm gone multiple times a week, if not for the whole week. How am I supposed to do that? And she's like, I'll help you until you figure it out. And so forced proximity and things. And it was cute. It was so cute. I loved his energy. It was great. Sticks and stones. Uh, sorry to this man, I guess. I don't really know where to put this. It was not bad. It was just over dramatic, And it sealed for me because I read this after the fucking wrong number. That maybe... A dark romance bend to hockey is not for me. I like both of those genres. I'm finding I don't like them together. There was just so much dramatic shit happening in this book, and I just didn't like it. Okay, these next books are all going to go together. I'm going to place them first, and I'll talk about it. That one night's going to go into the question area. Pucking Ever After Volume 2 is going all the way to the top. Pucking Around is going all the way to the top. Uh, Pucking Wild is going to go into that. And then Ever After is going to go with that one night. If you have been on Bookstagram or Book Talk at all in the last year, you have seen this book. You just have. There's no way you avoided it. There's no way. That one night is the initial novella. And it's Jake and Rachel hooking up in Seattle for one night. Not sharing names, phone numbers, anything. Having the best sex of their lives and then separating. Going about their ways like they planned. But Jake is like, god damn, I should have gotten that girl's number. What am I doing? So then we get to fucking around, which is the first full life novel in this series. Dr. Rachel Price gets placed at the Tampa Bay Rays uh, hockey facility for that NHL team to do a fellowship with their team training staff to finish out whatever she needs to accomplish whatever the fuck I don't care they see each other immediately freak out that they're seeing each other and then realize there's a no fraternization policy they can't like openly be together and they're like trying to figure that out at this point she's also met his best friend Caleb she doesn't know it's his best friend at this point he's the one who like picked her up from the airport in the very beginning of the book when she gets assigned to go to this place and I think she kind of like Loki hooks up with him kind of immediately. And uh, Caleb's great. I love Caleb. He's one of my favorite characters out of this whole bunch. And then later in the book comes the goalie, Am Amari Kanunin, a large Finnish man who is obsessed with her. I have never been so invested in a polyamorous relationship than I was with these people. This book was 756 pages long. And Emily, I... I love the story. I love the characters you created. But if you ever do that again, I swear to God, don't ever do that again. This book, much like Can the Consider Me, um, the Playing for Keeps series, is not for everyone. But when it is for you, it really hits. I enjoyed my time. It gave me a place to spend my time when I was in my depression cave. Pucking Ever After Volume 1, I don't remember a lot of details of. I just remember enjoying it. At one point, Rachel's, I think, pregnant in that storyline. Pucking Ever After Volume 2 hits hard. I loved that one. It follows a couple of things. You need to have read Pucking Wild before you read that. But I loved, absolutely loved everything that happened in that. Specifically, some things that happened with Caleb and Elmari. I won't spoil anything if you haven't read it. You have things to look forward to. And also keep in mind that, that that is, I think, three or five years post pucking around. And that's, I think, why I love this series so much is the way she keeps these characters alive, not only through these happily ever after volumes or like they appear in Pucking Wild. I'll explain that in a second. But also just like the things that she posts on her Instagram <laughs> and her TikTok are hilarious to me. 
a few months ago, she did a QA and a from the perspective of Jake and, like, from a question mark, was like, Jake's going to answer your questions. And it was just funny. And, like, it's a fictional character, obviously, and, like, we know she's the one answering it, but it was just, like, a fun thing. And when you're invested in characters and you're waiting for the next book to come out, it's just, like, a fun little thing. So Pucking Wild is the second full-length novel in that um, series. It was a normal length. I want to say 350 pages. So if you're looking at me like, girl, I'm glad you went on that, like, thousand-page journey through <laughs> the main book, the uh, the prequel novella, and then the subsequent novella is good for you. I'm not doing that. That's fine. Read Pucking Wild. It's fun. I absolutely love Ryan and Tess. T- Ryan is such a little golden retriever baby, and Tess is coming off of an awful emotionally abusive marriage, looking for a place to land, and Rachel's like, hey, now that we all live together, Omari's... Uh, beach house is just open go stay there it's fine you can stay there it's a good time ryan is recently injured and is also needing a place to stay because his apartment is on like a third floor walk up or something and he has a leg injury and he can't take crutches up there and i don't think he's an elevator for some reason so he ends up staying there too and through you know forest proximity and things they end up together and it is so fun can't wait for the next book in the series Emily's got me wrapped around her little finger. I will read just about anything she puts out. (laughs) Okay, next we have Rules We Break and Rules of Our Own. I can't remember which one's the novella and which one's the full-length novel. I think Rules of Our Own is a novel, so I'm going to put that... Well, I guess they're both going to go here because I don't remember a ton of the details. I just know that it's a... I don't know if it's why choose technically because the guys were like low-key together but not... But it's like another polyamorous situation. It's uh, MFM. And they knew each other in college. And the girl calls things off before things really get started. Because the guys are kind of fighting. And she's like, I'm not going to come between y'all's friendship. So they kind of get a second chance when one of their other friends is getting married. And they're part of this big friend group. And the friends who are having this destination wedding conspire to room the three of them together. And it's just explosive, and it was fun, and I really enjoyed it, but I couldn't really tell you much more than that. <laughs> Wildcat by Rebecca Jenkshack is going into Sorry to This Man because I don't remember a ton. I just remember that the male main character kind of spiraled through the end of the book for no good reason. It just didn't make any sense. Body Check is also going here because... I don't remember a ton. I just remember there being no communication between these grown-ass adults through the end of the book, and it just made it dramatic for no reason to me. And now I'm seeing them together in Face Off, and, like, they were great, and it was just like, why did we have to do that? I don't know. Meet Your Match by Candy Steiner. This is the first book in that hockey series that she created. Um, It came out before Watch Your Mouth. I'm going to put that in this question mark section because it was fine, but I didn't have the best time with it. Partly just because I, the concept was interesting. It was a woman who does PR and she was supposed to tail Vince, the hotshot of this hockey team, like 24-7, ends up living in his building. Like they put her in the building so that she's, you know, right there and can follow his routine from morning to evening. And he had this like big Playboy persona and it kind of dissipated but kind of didn't and it just felt weird to me. I don't really know how to explain more than that pucking revenge by Brittany nicole i loved this one and i'm gonna put that in i need him in a way that's concerning the feminism because brooks i think his name was i have never met a hotter virgin i haven't he for whatever reason had just never had sex with another person he had i shouldn't say that he had done other sexual acts he just had not had you know the big one if you will And, um, he's best friends with this girl who also happens to be the PR person for the team, who also is secretly dating the coach of that team, who also happens to be his married uncle. All of this comes out within, like, chapter one and two, so, like, this is not crazy big spoilers. They fake date, but he's always had feelings for her, and very quickly, things change. It's, the whole book is chaotic. And it's kind of dramatic, but in this case, the stuff that happens felt really realistic and it didn't feel 
like whiplash the way some of the other ones I described as dramatic did. And I think that's why it worked for me. Heart Trick by Kristen Granada is going to go in the questions because I remember having a good time with this, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I think the reason I'm putting up here instead of Sorry to This Man is because I do want to read the next book in this series. This one's a novella. The next one's a full-length um, novel. And actually, I think she just put out the third uh, installment of that. Second book, full-length book, but third installment of the series. Like last week or something, she's churning them out fast. And I really want to dive into that because I remember having a really good time, but I can't tell you what happened or why I had a good time. <laughs> and then lastly is Possessive Heart by Brighton Walsh. And I don't really know where to put this. Maybe, and I need him in a way that's concerning to feminism because this man, he just kept showing up for the girl in the in the book in a way that was very comforting to me. There's a point where her brother's yelling at her. They have no idea that these two are hooking up. And they like run a business together. And they're like, maybe not yelling at her is the wrong word, but they kind of are, but they're also kind of talking down to her. She's the baby of the family, but she runs the whole thing. He comes out and he's like, you have two seconds to apologize to her or I'm beating your ass. And he's best friends with some of these guys. So it's not even like some rando guy. So the fact that like he's standing up for her in this way was kind of a big deal. And he's like, you won't disrespect her in front of me ever again. You like your teeth? You want them to stay in your mouth? Don't ever disrespect her like that again in front of me. So good. So good. He cares for her so deeply and knows that they're endgame that... He buys this fancy mansion or maybe has it built just outside of town. She's up there meeting him for something. He has all of her favorite everything in this house. Everything. Snacks, wine, whatever. It designs rooms based on things he knows she likes because he knows they're eventually going to be together. And that might sound unhinged, but if you read this story and their history, because they have like a 10 year long history, you'll understand. It's not actually creepy. It was great. So those are all of the books that I have ever read on Kindle Unlimited that are hockey romances. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you got this far, leave a hockey stick emoji in the comments. Give this a like. Uh, share it with somebody who's maybe new to hockey romance and needs some recommendations. And with that being said, I will see you in another video soon. Goodbye.